Thank you all for joining us for our six Howard Mathematica lunchtime talk with Chris Hoffman from the Research IT Office at the University of California, Berkeley. During these chats while you chew, you'll meet interesting people or organizations that are doing cool and complimentary work to what you're currently learning about in the Summer Institute at Howard. If you don't have your lunch yet, hit pause. For those of you with food and beverage in hand, let's get started. Hi everyone, thanks Nanette, and nice to meet all of you today. I'm Chris Hoffman, I'm Associate Director at Research IT at UC Berkeley, and I'm going to be talking about what you can do to protect your research data. Right, so here's the outline of what I'm going to be going through today. I'll be introducing myself and then talking about research data, th threats to research data and to the subjects of our research. I'll be talking just a little bit about the complex involving regulatory framework out there, but really I wanna spend most of my time talking about what you as social scientists can do about research data security. So again, I'm Chris Hoffman. I'm currently working in a group called Research IT here at UC Berkeley. But previously, I was an archaeologist on campus and I got a PhD in the anthropology department in the early 90s. So I am a social scientist and have actually recently gone back and started doing more work, even with my data. So I'll, I'll be revisiting that shortly. Threats to research data. OK, there's, there's actually many different kinds of threats to research data. And the ones that really get the headlines are those that are intentional. There are a number of you know, types of attack, and you know, you'll see these listed in the news and on websites, phishing, denial of services, uh, viruses, um, uh, viruses that do things like try to you know, actually capture what you're typing on your keyboard. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of virus called ransomware where actually this isn't, uh, the, the issue here is that if what's on your computer is valuable to you, then somebody may you know, think of that as a target where they install ransomware on your computer, it may encrypt your data, and then they make you pay in order to re, you know, gain access to your data again. Of course, there's also the risk of physical theft, of physical theft, excuse me, of your computer. That's another type of risk to research data. And you know, this is a very kind of fast moving, evolving space uh, with hackers combining these these, these techniques in different ways and inventing new techniques at the same time. Now, in addition, there are a number of threats to research data simply through accidents and disasters and um, the lack of best practices. So I think we all know about you know, natural disasters that can destroy our servers, our computers, even our backups. Those are natural disasters and they are, they're also human-made disasters. Um, and in addition, you know, things like, you know, um, you know, spilling coffee or dropping your laptop, those can also result in the loss of data. So I want to really refer you to the talk by Aaron Foster and Anna Sackman, also part of this series called Supporting Your Data, How to Keep Yourself Sane. There are just so many things that can happen to your data. Now, I mentioned earlier that I've had the opportunity to go back and look at my research data from the early 1990s. And there are a number of reasons that I'm doing this. Um, however, I, I found that you know, there are things that I am able to do in terms of working with my earlier data, and then there are things that I can't do. So fortunately, I kept raw data from my research, uh, which was an archeology span uh, dissertation, um, but I didn't really have them organized very well. I didn't use, have good file naming conventions. And then I also used some software that produced, produced some charts and graphs and those were in a software package that no longer even exists. But fortunately, I can take those data and actually you know, learn some new you know, techniques like R and Python notebooks. So that's been exciting. But you know, there are things that I have access to and things that I can't. So think of yourself in the future wanting to come back and work with your data. Now, then I think as social scientists, it's also worth, worth thinking about the, the threats to the subjects of our data. Like, what are the... What are the what are the communities and the social issues that we're actually studying? Uh, for many social scientists, human subjects is a very real issue. Perhaps you've had to develop an IRB protocol for your research, and in that you probably had to talk about risk to subjects and how you're going to protect them, and that includes their data. 
But in addition, as social scientists, we're dealing with very complex issues around communities, around social justice. And I think you're all probably already very aware of for your particular research, the kinds of ethical issues that, that are related to the data that you're gathering. So we as social scientists have certain you know, additional responsibilities beyond, um, beyond other kinds of research. Now, I think it's also, I would like to consider a little bit about why social sciences data may be more at risk. Um, these days, you know, social scientists are working with larger data sets, more complex data sets, data sets that relate to very sensitive kinds of issues. In addition, we're developing new techniques and methods out of data science and, and other data sciences and other fit fields that allow us to generate new findings, machine learning, um, et cetera, where we can work with larger data sets. And in general, because these findings and these data are generating more valuable and more impactful findings, they're more attractive to others, including you know, bad actors, people who would like to take those data for their own purposes. And again, because maybe these are more valuable, more impactful, just the simple, the simple issue that they are of value makes them um, at risk to, to ransomware. If somebody encrypted your data and stole it from you, you might be willing to pay to get it back. Now, I want to take just a little bit of sidebar here. I know that there's a panel that's part of the, uh, the Institute here this summer around the metaverse as a, as a space for social sciences research. And this is something that's of interest to me. And I just wanted to you know, share a little bit about some of the information I've been looking at on this, on this topic. So here's um, a really interesting article that came out in 2020 of a, a research that found that just with you know, a group of 511 participants watching five 20 second videos on their um, using a VR headset, they were able to identify 95% of those people uniquely. And uh, in that study, they really only used kind of the actual headset and the hand controllers and the, the motion data um, from those devices to identify the person. But now we're actually seeing headsets that are coming out with eye tracking, that are coming out with you know, hand controls. So instead of just clicking on a button, it can actually see the, the movement of your hands. There are researchers studying gait and full motion of a person wearing VR. And different kinds of sensors are being included that measure heart rate, that may do EAEG, um, or other kinds of biometric data that might be, might be gathered through sensors. So this is increasing the risk or the likelihood that, that people can be identified from their data that are available through, through an XR technology space. Fortunately, there's actually a lot of literature that's emerging here about the, you know, the kinds of data, helping us think about the kinds of data, putting those into some categories and really thinking through risks to privacy. So there's a lot of work here and I think it's a space that's very I think, ripe for um, social science studies. Now, when we face this kind of situation where new kinds of data, new kinds of risks, how do institutions respond? Well, of course, they develop complex regula regulatory frameworks and policies, and they require us to follow them, right? And these, in the security research, data security space, these are, this is a very complex issue where we have universities, funding agencies, federal and state and international governments um, developing uh, requirements and policies and procedures, and data providers themselves are also stepping in and saying like, this is what you have to do in order to receive data from us. People are increasingly hearing the word audit is something that may happen with regard to how their, their data are being you know, used in a research context. So this puts researchers in a very difficult position. And then if you compare, you, if you combine that with other kinds of pressures being brought onto researchers to share data and to have you know, open data, then there's, there's actually a, a conflict. So we have researchers ask this question all the time. How, how do I balance these different requirements? Um, this is a hard question and really depends on the specifics of the kind of research that you're doing and the data that you're working with. Um, generally, you know, requirements for security 
um, or protecting subjects will overrule or, or trump requirements to share data. But that doesn't mean you can't share data. You just have to be aware of what data you can share, whether it's de-identified or at an aggregate level, um, and what data you, you're not allowed to share. So again, this, this is really the, the quandary that many researchers find themselves in. It's like, this is, this is really hard. This is very complex. Do, do I have to become an IT security expert? Hopefully not. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about you know, some of what you need to know and be aware of, but really there, there are a lot of things that you can do to help yourself, help your research subjects, um, and, and help your discipline move forward. So first, I think really, we do all have a responsible to know what we're responsible for. What are the data you have um, across the life cycle of your project? Not what are you just receiving at the, at the beginning of your project, but what are you generating? What are you combining your data with, with um, you know, other data sources? And this is where you know, topics of organization, file naming, um, directory structures, or documentation are really important. Then, um, in obtaining data, you may have signed actually some terms and conditions, or perhaps you know, your, your faculty advisor or someone else, maybe the university itself has signed to say that, that you, you can be responsible for the data that you're working with. So I really encourage people, you know, read these data use agreements, read campus policies. And when you don't understand something, ask a question. I'm gonna to return to this um, to really empower you to think about how to make sure you know what you're responsible for. Um, you'll hear a lot about the shared responsibility model um, when talking about data security. And that just means that everyone has a role to play in protecting data. And that includes you, your, your advisors, your peers, um, and IT providers, and the university as a whole. Second, there are tools and services out there that are available to you. Many of them might be available on your campus through a central IT office, a research IT office like where I work, research data management program through your library and through your security office. And then in addition, look outside. What's going on at other institutions? Do academic societies provide any resources or advice on ways to protect your research data? Now, I believe that there are a number of best practices that really are you know, quite easy to do I mean, you do have to spend time doing these, but they do go a long way to protecting your, your data. And we'll go, we'll go through some of these shortly, but let me just kind of compare um, when, when we deal with, when we develop a security plan, say for a campus or for an office or for a whole group, it's divided into administrative controls, technology controls and physical controls. Well, even on the individual scale of you and your research, they, those correspond to really Kind of thinking holistically about you know the threats and the ways to protect your information. So administrative controls are basically around people and processes. Technology controls are around hardware and software. And physical controls, well, really that's about you know making sure that your laptop isn't stolen or providing you know you want to prevent inappropriate access to your computer, sitting down at a cafe and looking over your shoulder at, at your, your data and names of your subjects. So then next, I just step through a number of these kind of minimum security standards that really should apply to, to all your devices, you know, not just your laptop, but your, your mobile phone as well. Um, you wanna make sure that those are being automatically updated, that the operating systems and applications are being patched, that you have antivirus and firewalls running. Those, those often are actually built into whatever kind of computer you're using. You want to use a strong password. If you have access to a password manager, that's a really good thing to do and can simplify your life enormously. You want to configure your device, your device to, to lock a screen or log off after a certain amount of time, depending on you know, what your work situation is. Um, you know, practice safe computing. Don't just click on any link. Um, look before you click. Is, is that a secure website? Do you contacting you and asking you for information. The principle of least access. Be careful about how much data you obtain. We like, 
at least I love to get as much data as possible, but I've had to train myself. That's not necessarily the, the right way to go. Know when to get rid of data and back up your data and back it up securely. I'll talk about encryption in the next slide. Um, you know, these are a number of things, like not sharing your accounts. Some of these are very logical and, and sometimes difficult to do in, in real time. So I said I would talk about encryption. And uh, you'll often see in the security literature the, the distinction between encryption at rest and in transit. And really, that means at, at rest is when your data are stored. And in transit is when they're being moved from, from place to place. <clears throat> Both Macintosh and Windows computers now come with built-in full disk encryption. On the Macintosh, that's called File Vault. And on Windows, that's called Depth Locker. And those are just, you know, encryption just goes a long way to protecting your data. And they don't, it doesn't really introduce a big burden on your computer. All right. It just takes a little bit longer to start up, but then if something happens, you can just say, I have full disk encryption turned on. Um, however, you can also just encrypt certain files or even folders. And that's another good practice if um, full disk encryption does not work for you. You might need to apply the same techniques to external drives, thumb drives or port portable hard drives. And really in any place that, that data are stored, whether it's in, in the cloud, um, on a shared file server, you know, adding an, an additional layer of encryption is always a, a good thing to do, especially with highly sensitive data. Now in transit, that really means that during any kind of transfer, whether that's by sending through email, downloading from a website, um, or using an FTP site. Now I'm not going to go into this um, here, but there are types of encryption that are actually are known to be like unsecure, uh, where people have defeated the, the algorithms, the programs that, that encrypt files. So the level of encryption is an issue, but if you're using up-to-date software, you're probably going to be okay. Uh, just a quick word here, phys physical security, um, practice paranoia. There are people out there that are very good at stealing laptops. So please be aware that this is a, a still something that is very common risk to, to devices and data. And on that topic of practicing paranoia, just know hackers and scammers, they're out there working over time as well. They're very, very good at what they do. So just be aware of, of that, that that is happening. Now, you will wish there was more help out there. Right. So what I've talked about is some of the resources that you have, tools and services, people you can talk to, but there's still a lot of gaps in terms of you know, what you really could use to, to make things you know, better for um, in terms of protecting your research data. So to that end, I'm going to ask you to put pressure on your departments and on campus leadership. This is a very difficult area for universities to really deal with um, at the highest level because the need really cuts across different offices that do different things. You all know universities are complex organizations and to deal with something holistically is complex because we found in developing our programs that you need, you need technology, you need tools and services, secure data storage, but you need consultants and community, people who have expertise in certain areas to make sure that you're using those tools appropriately and correctly. And then you, we really also need clear policy and realistic expectations about what we can all actually do in terms of, in terms of these requirements. So I, I say this because the researcher's voice is so important um, at the campus level in making headway on these kinds of complex topics. When people in an IT organization go to leadership and ask for funding, it only works if we have the voice of the researcher at our side or in front of us. Now, also, this is a really interesting area, and um, I, I would like to encourage you to build community with your peers. This is not just an issue at your university. Right? This is a national and even an international issues. So there are opportunities to talk with others. And you know, there are, there are social scientists out here who will find that this is 
an area that they want to develop you know, further expertise in. So we'd encourage you, like I have, to develop some expertise there. Um, I am on one of UC Berkeley's IRB committees, and I can tell when somebody has done a little bit of homework and is able to talk about maybe the level of encryption that they're using for their data transfers. So this is an area where you can actually show off as well. Um, transparency. So I think it's turning a little bit to social justice and, and data. Um, transparency is key for you and for your subjects. But, but do be careful, again, because there are bad actors out there who, who will use information. It's very, you know, we, we all like to use um, versioning systems like GitHub. And I'll say it's actually very easy to accidentally put a password in a GitHub file. And once it's out there, it, it's available to everybody. So do be careful about you know, what, what, you, what you share. And then again, I, I would just like to kind of end with this thought that social scientists really can be impactful in this space of research data security. And that there are many opportunities for research and for the development of new approaches to these challenges. And I think there really are some interesting and important issues around social justice, diversity, and equity. And this is because these challenges, as like many other challenges, impact our communities differently and disproportionately. And that we need diverse perspectives and expertise that develop the kinds of holistic and targeted solutions and approaches that, that can really help all of us. So with that, I really want to thank you for um, listening to my presentation, to watching this, and I look forward to hearing from you. Here's my email address here, and I'm very happy to um, uh, hear from you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Chris. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A with you and other members of the Berkeley Library community uh, in June at the Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you all for watching. For more information on six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.